Thank you. Cool. How's everyone doing today? I'm, I feel like I'm between you and lunch. <laughs> it's, it's a hard, hard time. Hopefully this is, this is interesting. I know authentication is a hard subject, but we'll go over it together slowly. <clears throat> I'm recovering from a cough too, so. All right. In the beginning, usernames and passwords were created. This meant that we could safely and securely create accounts without fear of attackers prying into our accounts or gaining access to our information. This was really great. But as the web matured, so did the services online, which meant that we had to create usernames and passwords that were unique to every service. Or at least, idealistically, that's what should have happened. Realistically, what happened is that we reused usernames and passwords. I know I do that constantly, regardless of the fact that I have a password manager. It's pretty terrible. <laughs> And so um, this made people very angry and has widely been regarded as a bad move. Um, and <laughs> which is kind of why the FIDO Alliance was created, or the Fast Identity Online Alliance. And the whole point of FIDO was to unify identity online and make, it, make authentication a first class citizen so that people realize the importance of authentication and there were best practices and strategies to implement them in our applications. The issue here is that with alliances and federations comes a lot of jargon and confusion. So if you've ever tried to read a white paper or anything like that, it would be incredibly confusing. And so there was a huge gap between the alliance and the best strategies and the developers who are actually implementing things. If you've worked with authentication or tried to implement stuff, you'd know exactly what I mean. Um, and here's like an example of an OpenID Connect white paper that I tried to read. It's really long, <laughs> really, really long. And this is only like one part of five parts of this. Like my, my computer basically blew up when I tried to take a screen grab. Um, and the whole point that I'm trying to make here is that it's really confusing for a developer like you and I to dive into all of the strategies that FIDO and federations are trying to tell us to, to implement in our apps. And so this is a bit frustrating because like if effectively these alliances and the point of them is to give us strategies that we'll then use so that we can have secure applications. But of course there's this disconnect that's happening. And so this whole talk is called authentication for the rest of us, the rest of us. Uh, <laughs> For those of us who find that very confusing, because we're all developers here, also we use REST, which is super nice. Um, and so with that, um, we'll begin. But before that, Vance mentioned who I am, but I'll reintroduce myself. I am Divya Sasidharan. I am a developer experience engineer at Netlify. Do people use Netlify here? What? <laughs> That's crazy. Um, this is great. This is a great opportunity for you to use Netlify. Um, so essentially what Netlify is, is a, it's a platform that offers you tools to uh, deploy your static applications online. It's super nice, super easy. Um, and as an experienced engineer, I work on creating content and tools and integrations to help developers use the platform and kind of ramp up with it. So like, if you're interested in Netlify, I know lots of you don't use it, but I have stickers. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> and also we're hiring, uh, so Netlify is really great, we're remote, mostly remote, um, and we're actively hiring, we just opened a role for a front end engineer, so if anyone's interested, come find me, I have stickers, as I mentioned. <laughs> Hopefully that's enough to convince you to talk to me. And so as we continue, um, I just want to have a disclaimer that don't panic. Authentication is very confusing. It's confusing to me at least. I'm only gonna touch like the tip of the iceberg of authentication. Um, and of course, like hopefully this gives you the tools to kind of go on and further your knowledge. Also, they'll be really fun if you didn't notice Hitchhiker's references um, that I'll use as very elaborate metaphors to explain authentication in painful detail. So I hope you enjoy them as much as I did when I created this presentation. Um, and so with that, um, we'll dive into like the first few parts. So with authentication, of course, it's important for us to understand why we're doing things, right? Of course, it's like we all know why, but I'm gonna start with that and then we'll move into like the actual implementation details of it. And so with authentication, like why does it even matter? Why do we care that this matters? So as I said, I'm gonna use a very painful metaphor. So assume you're a Vogon. So a Vogon is a alien species that's in the Hitchhiker's Guide. Essentially, there are evil alien species. Their whole point is to destroy Earth as a whole. 
because they want to build a bypass <laughs> through Earth, um, and that's pretty much their goal. And so if you are a Vogon and you have destruction plans to destroy Earth, you might not want humans or any races who care about humans and Earth to have access to that, right? You want to have protected, you want that to be a protected resource. And so you might want to create an authentication layer on top of your plans. So instead of looking like destruction plans, it can look like saving the planet plans or whatever you want it to mask it as. And so that's essentially from a high level, the idea of authentication as protecting your resources. And so the other thing is that I often talk, and I might have mentioned this already, the corollary to authentication, which is authorization. Those two things tend to go together. They're related, but not exactly the same thing. So here's another painful metaphor. Assume you're a hitchhiker. So Ford Prefect is one of the protagonists. Uh, Arthur Dent is really the protagonist. So Ford Prefect is the side, sidekick to the protagonist. So essentially, he's a hitchhiker. Um, and the idea of a hitchhiker is that they generally hitchhike onto passing spaceships. So they themselves don't have vehicles to transport themselves, but they get onto passing spaceships, and that's how they move through the universe. So if you're a hitchhiker, you have this thing called an electronic thumb which is just a device that allows you to hitchhike. So you can think of it like an authentication device of some form. So with that electronic thumb, you're just notifying people that, hey, I'm a hitchhiker, because this is like a device in which you broadcast who you are. So with that electronic thumb, Ford Prefect can then authenticate himself as a hitchhiker, which is really nice, because then a passing spaceship might be able to be like, OK, I'll allow you to hitchhike onto my spaceship. But the thing with authentication is, yes, it allows you to authenticate who you are, but it doesn't necessarily authorize your ability to access a resource. So let's say in the book, for instance, uh, Arthur Dent and Ford Prefect get access onto a Vogon ship. That's pretty much the first part of the story, but they're not authorized to be on that ship. Uh, and the Vogons are actually really angry that they're on the ship, and they tell them like terrible Vogon poetry. This will make sense if you read the book. Um, and so, and it's, it's not relevant, but the whole point is that they're not authorized to be on that spaceship. And so because they're not authorized, they're actually booted off completely. And so they're authenticated as hitchhikers, but not authorized to stay on the ship. So that's kind of the corollary and how those two things work. And so now we have a sense of like from a high level, those two concepts. Let's figure out like how it works in applications that we use day to day. So a login page is the most common form of an authentication layer. If you've ever logged into a service, you probably have, uh, you would have come across this. So you would have implemented this in an application of some form at some point. So you have a login page. It takes in a username and a password. It might take you then through a login flow. So sometimes that means having a loading state, assuming there's a lot of things that need to be loaded. But eventually, you then get passed onto a dashboard or a profile. And that has information that's pertinent to that user. So it's very specific information and credentials associated with that user. So that's essentially, from a high level, that login flow that happens. And so one way of implementing that in the kind of going in the weeds is using basic auth. So basic auth, of course, I'm going to start with like very basic and then move towards something that's a bit more advanced. Generally, you don't use basic auth because it's not very secure. And I'll explain exactly why right now. So the idea with basic auth is that you have, we'll go back to this electronic thumb reference, you pass in a username and a password. So Ford Prefect and then his password, this is not a drill. And then you get a ID token of some form. So it's just a string of symbols and characters, kind of unintelligible. And then with that, you can then pass it on to a resource server. So once you have that ID token, you pass it on to a resource server as an authorization basic header. And then with that, you then get whatever resource you're trying to access. So in JSON, for instance, in this case, you get the specific user that has been logged in. So that's from a high level what it is. And so that ID token I was mentioning, or that string of symbols and characters, that's just a username and a password that's base64 encoded with a colon in between them. So it's not very secure. <laughs> if you can kind of tell, it's just the idea that it's a username and a password. And so let's assume you have multiple services and every one of them uses basic auth. So that means that you're broadcasting every time you're authenticating your username and your password. Because base64 encoding is actually not very difficult to crack. Um, and so this is problematic, right? Because it's very chatty and very noisy. You're constantly passing in 
supposedly secure information. And so if you were a hitchhiker, that is terrible because a passing Vogon ship will find you and they will destroy you because they do not like humans. Basically, they don't like anyone, hitchhikers particularly, I believe. And so that's not necessarily something we want to implement. It's what was implemented in the past. We've moved past that since. Um, but that's just to give you a history of how authentication started and, w and w we'll move to where we are today. And so the co like something else that we work on instead of doing basic auth is session-based auth. So that's kind of a improvement from basic auth. And so the idea of session-based auth is very similar. The workflow is very similar. You pass in a username and a password to an auth server, and then it sends you a session ID. Oftentimes it sets a cookie to your specific client. So you have that session ID with that set cookie. And then with that cookie itself, you can then pass that to a resource server you, so you can do a get request with that cookie. So because that session ID is in that cookie, the resource server knows that you are an authenticated user and you're authorized to get access to that. So that's generally session-based authentication. But, but again, we come across a specific problem. So in general, REST is stateless, but session-based auth is stateful because the whole point is that the session or like the specific point in which a user log, logs in is noted in that token. And so one thing is that you don't therefore get access to other things. So a session is specific to a service. So most of the time when we access a service, there are subservices associated with that service. So let's say you're accessing your Gmail. You might want to access like Google Analytics, which often is tied to your Gmail account. But with this particular session-based auth, you can't do that because it's very specific to the domain that you're on. And so what that means is that if you're authenticated to get onto one Vogon spaceship, you might not be able to get onto others without having to do that same auth dance over and over again. Um, and the other thing with uh, cookie-based authentication or doing set cookie is that it's very, again, domain specific. So you can't share a lot of information across domains, which is kind of problematic because we want something that's a bit stateless. So instead of having something that's session-based, we can have something that's token-based, which is generally the practice that's used in applications. And so the idea of token-based auth is that, again, you're doing the same thing. You're passing in a username and a password. That doesn't change. That hardly ever changes. But the thing is how the auth server responds in kind. So you pass in a username and a password, and the auth server responds with a string, like a string of symbols and characters. So you might notice it's a lot longer than the basic auth one. The idea here is it has a lot of encoding associated with it, and that's an ID token. And with that ID token, you can then use that to access a resource server. Generally, that's instead of doing a basic authorization basic header, you're using an authorization bearer header. And so with that, you then get whatever information you're trying to access. So that is the main difference between you using like basic auth and then token-based auth and session auth. So from a high level, that's essentially how it works. So that's really nice and really cool. Um, but the next part of it is kind of like, what exactly is that ID token? So I talked in like kind of just flippantly about how, what it is, but it's actually really important to understand what that piece is. So generally that ID token is called a JWT. I think people call it JWT, but I think it sounds ridiculous. So I keep saying JWT even though it's a bit longer. Um, so the idea of a JSON web token is this huge string of characters, which is pretty unintelligible, but it actually is actually, you can break it down into pieces that make it a bit clearer. So you might not have noticed this, but once I color encode it, you might notice it. There's actually three parts to it. So it's decimal um, separated. So the first part is the header, the second part is the payload, and the third part is the signature. And I'll explain what all of these pieces are in detail, in painful detail. But first, before we go into that, it's useful to understand the idea of how a JWT is created. So generally with JWT, there's this whole point of symmetric algorithms. We'll talk about asymmetric algorithms as well, so you can see the difference between that. But the idea of a symmetric algorithm is that you use a secret. So your authentication server and your resource server both share a secret. And with that secret, they are encoding and decoding information. And so you see this idea of a header and a payload, which is then encoded with a signature, or encoded, and then you get a signature. And then on the below part, when you're verifying a JWT, 
you're essentially decoding it with the secret to get a signature. So when those signatures match, you know that that user is authenticated and everything is okay. So that's from a high level how that works, is the idea of things being symmetrical. So let's look into what that looks like when you look at the JSON. So JWT is a JSON web token, so it's JSON. Very easy to understand, actually, if you break it down. So the first part is the header. And the header consists of two things. It's, it's fairly straightforward. There's the algorithm, and the algorithm is what is used to uh, encode that token. So here it's using HS256. It's specifically a cryptographic method. Uh, you don't have to know exactly how that cryptographic method is. I don't know how it works. It's totally fine if you don't. Um, and it is of type JWT. And so those are the two things that go into the header. The most important part being that algorithm. So the JWT knows exactly how to encode and decode. The second part is the payload aspect of it. So the payload generally, as you might notice, has user-specific information. So there is a name, there is a sub, which generally has an email, for instance. It's essentially tying that token to a user. And then you might have an expiration. So this is in Unix time. That's generally the format for how it is. And expiration is really important because in contrast to our session-based ID, a JWT actually expires. And that's important to note because that allows things to be secure because you don't want someone accessing your JWT to forever have access to a specific service. So generally, that expiry is very important and it's a key difference between prior means of auth. And then, of course, you can also add specific app metadata. So this is where you can add things like, here I added a role. So if you've ever done authentication and authorization, you might have come across role-based redirects. If you haven't, I'll go, uh, I'll go into detail on a specific example of how that works so you understand. But essentially, it's this idea of making sure that a specific user is, has permission to access certain routes. So in this case, Ford Prefect is a journalist and therefore he might not have access to HQ and like specific admin and editor privileges to changing what's in the Hitchhiker's Guide, for example. So that's the idea of the payload. And then the third piece is the signature aspect. So this is kind of where that algorithm comes into play. So we use HS256. So here, that is exactly that same thing. HMAC SHA-256 is just the long form of what HS256 is. And then, of course, we're base64 encoding that header and payload, which I showed you earlier. And then this is where that secret is used to then get that signature that is specific to that JWT. And so this is a really nice playground. Um, it's called JWT.io. It allows you to paste a JWT that you might have and dig into what exactly the different pieces of it are. It's really handy. Um, and it's helped me a lot to understand how the, 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 diff the different pieces work. It also, you can go back and forth. You can paste it, and you can also change your metadata as you go along. So you can see how your token changes as you're changing specific information. It's actually really interesting. And so with symmetric algorithms explained, we can move into the asymmetric part. And so asymmetric, you might notice already, is kind of different visually. You notice there's two keys instead of one single key. So if you've ever used a service like Google or GitHub or any of that, that generally uses these public-private key. So the idea of it is that the authentication and the resource server each have a public and private key separately. And so with those things, they can encode and then decode. So generally, the encoding happens with the private key. The decoding happens with the public key. And so it's asymmetric because of the fact that those two keys don't match even though they can still access and decode and encode the same JWT itself. So that's the main like, difference between it. And so if we looked at how that looks like in JSON, again, like, there's not much difference between what we looked at earlier, except for the fact that the header has this algorithm, which is RS-256. So that's specifically that algorithm used to encode that JWT. And then, of course, the type is the exact same. We use JWT. And then the payload, there is absolutely no difference. I'm not adding anything else. I have a name sub exp, and I'm also having that app metadata. So again, like not much different. The payload is actually identical to what we had before. The difference 
also is the bottom part of the signature. So here I'm showing you both the public and private key, but you won't be using both. You'd use one or the other, depending on whether you're encoding or decoding. So here I'm using the RSA SHA-256, so that's the algorithm RS-256. You base64 encode your header and your payload, and then you use whatever public or private key you want. And then with that, you get the JWT you want. So again, very similar to what we had earlier, uh, you can r jump into jwt.io to jump to like look woo, to look into the different parts of how that works, um, and that's a really nice way to learn about how exactly that JWT works and how it's encoded specifically. So this is pretty nice. We talked about JWT and authentication as a whole, and so now that we have like a sense of like high level concepts, we got we went over like many different things. Um, let's try to bring it all together uh, with an implementation. So, oh my gosh, this is, <laughs> uh, okay, that did not work, never mind. The idea of like this whole demo, <laughs> uh, what was that? It's Innotech? What was that? I'm not authenticated, that's right. This is like a whole, I don't even know the password though. Okay, oh, it's Innotech 20. 2019. Oh, it's just 19? Okay, cool. Yay, it's a group effort. I should have done this before. <laughs> I always assume that I would be like already on the internet. Yay, thank you, appreciate it. Okay, so going back to the demo. So this is a very naive demo. Let me uh, delete this token for a sec. So the whole point of this demo is to generate your own JWT. It's generally not recommended to you ever do that. But for demonstration purposes, uh, because I went into detail on what exactly JWT is, how to sign it, all of that information, um, this demo kind of shows you how to implement that so that you can play around with things. So here is a demo that shows you um, a way to generate a JWT. So there is, what was that? Was that a question? Oh, okay. Um, so here I'm gonna spell my name correctly and then I'm gonna pass in an email, and here you might notice that there's different roles, so there's admin, editor, and visitor. So I'm gonna keep admin on, and I'm gonna generate a token. And so this magically redirects, but the idea is you might see this like long token that I'm generating. Um, I also have a really handy dandy Chrome extension, really nice, that allows me to do some JWT exploration, so that might be a bit small. Um, ooh, it does not zoom in, Extensions, that's interesting, I didn't know that. Um, so the, the whole point of this extension, for those of you who can't see, is that it allows me to see my JWT and it breaks it down. So it's actually not much different to me copying that JWT and pasting it in JWT.io. And so essentially, it's the same idea. It shows me some app metadata and it shows me a exp expiration date and that algorithm. So the header, the payload, all of that is much, very much the same. And of course, like with this particular thing, I can then like go to a specific gated site. So this is a gated site, not, not very well designed, but the whole point is that I have a specific role that therefore lets me access it. So let me show you an example where I am not authorized. So let's assume I'm a visitor. I'm gonna use the same uh, credentials. So I'm gonna generate that authentication layer and every time I try to go to that protected site, I get redirected back. So you might notice like you do not have the right access privileges and that's because I don't have the proper role. So just to give you a visual explanation and example of the importance of role-based redirects or the way you can tell a specific user's role and change whether or not they can access a resource. So it's the same with specific routes as well. If you do SPA, that's pretty handy. And so that's like from a high level, the implementation details. So essentially how that works is you have a login page and then I have an auth server in which I'm passing in the username and password. It's giving me a JWT back in which I'm then passing to the resource server and the resource server then gives me some JSON. So again, just to go over that same workflow, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And so let's dive into how exactly that works. I kind of want to show you how you can potentially roll your own JWT. It's not recommended, like don't ever do it, but it's a really nice exercise um, just because I think I, I learned a lot from doing it. Uh, I know I'll never do it, um, but it's a nice way for you to play around with how JWT is assigned, change algorithms and so on. 
So I'm going to be using a serverless functions or functions as a service. Pick your poison. Um, and so that's pretty straightforward. Uh, I'm going to be using Netlify functions for this. You can use Firebase functions, Azure functions, any other functions you can potentially think of. Um, I use Netlify functions because I work in Netlify. And also because they are very nice. Uh, but under the hood, they work with AWS Lambda. So, but the nice thing is that with AWS Lambda, you, you have to use API Gateway. With Netlify functions, you do not have to use API Gateway, which if you've ever used API Gateway is a nightmare. Uh, or maybe it's just me, but I think it's a nightmare <laughs> to handle and work with. And so Netlify Functions is super nice and easy. So for Netlify Functions to start working with it, assume you have a project already created. You can create a folder, and I'm going to create a single file called jwt.js, and it will just have a bunch of JavaScript in it. And so once I do that, and if I deploy with Netlify, um, I have a route that's access, that's accessible. So if I have like whatever.netlify.com, I can then access that specific function using slash dot netlify slash functions name a file. So that's a really handy, nice thing for me if I already have a site and I want to run functions. So that's why I kind of use it because I deploy with Netlify and I want access to functions. So I use Netlify functions. And so for this, we're going to use the JSON web token package, uh, which again is like one way for you to sign and work with JSON web tokens without you having to write all the algorithms. So you still kind of get a sense of how to work with JSON web tokens without you having to write stuff, which is super nice. And I'm going to use some like UUID, which is just unique ID creation so that I don't have to like, again, create that on my own. And so generally what I'm going to start with is an xbox.handler. So again, if you've worked with any serverless function, this is generally the format of how it works. And then with that, I'm going to start by creating a uh, the JSON web token. And so for that, I'm going to assume I'm passing in some information. So I can parse that in the body. So in the body, I'm passing in some secrets and claims and user metadata or whatever. So I can grab that from the, the body itself. And then using object deconstruction, I can grab the different pieces I need. So here I'm grabbing claims, I'm grabbing roles, and a secret as well, which I can then use to encode the J JWT. And then the next two parts are just getting an expiry date, which you can just imagine, it's just doing some time, time things. And then the next part is to then generate the JWT. And so the generating JWT part is, we'll, we'll go over it in a second, but get expiry is pretty straightforward. It's just doing some math. I'm not going to show you how that is because it's just get one hour from current time. So whatever you want to do, that's how you do it. And so to generate JWT, I'm going to pass in all of those um, query string parameters that I grabbed, like claims and roles and so on. And then I'm going to sign it. So this is like the idea of encoding, right? So I'm signing that token. And so to sign it, I'm going to pass in an expiry and some app metadata. So very similar to when we were decoding it, it has that information. And then I'm going to pass in that secret, which is the last signature. And then assuming everything works and I generated a token, I can then in my callback give it back to my client. So I'm like, hey, I generated a thing. Here you go. And so if I, from my front end, wanted to do stuff with it, here is a way of accessing that route. So I'm just like fetching that specific token. So here is a fetch to that route. And then with that, like the res or the body of that result will then have my token. I can then do other things. So assume I have a different route called like super secret function, which is only accessible if I have a specific role. I can then like do an authorization bearer with token and post to that and then get multiple things um, that I want access to. And so that's pretty nice, the ability of you going to an authentication server, getting a token, and then passing it down to your resource server through a bearer. Um, but one thing that's super nice, which I think I showed you earlier, is this ability to set cookies. Because again, like if you're accessing one single domain, it's nice to have so you don't have to constantly set a header back and forth. And cookies kind of happen automatically every time you make a request. So here is the same workflow, username and password, and I'm doing a set cookie. So the auth server is just setting a cookie onto that client, which means that the client has to do nothing when it wants to access anything on the resource itself, because it just automatically happens once the cookie, the cookie automatically gets passed. So that's super nice and super handy. And so for that, we can jump into like, we can modify our previous function so here we use like again JSON web tokens. That's not much different, um, but we're gonna add like the cookie library, which allows you to set a cookie. 
Again, I'm not rolling anything on my own because it's much easier to use other people's stuff, assuming they work. Um, and so here is like, I'm gonna create a cookie. I'm gonna call it Netlify cookie. You can call it whatever you want. And I'm gonna serialize it. So this is generally how to work with that library. You do a serialize and then I name that cookie. So here it's called NF underscore JWT. Again, you can name it whatever you like. I pass in that token and cookies generally take in a couple of parameters. So here it takes in a secure true. So assuming it's always a secure connection and then I pass in a path. So it's a root and then obviously it has an expiration as well. And so that's generally what a cookie and how it works is. And then in my callback, I can then set. So this is like assuming this function is essentially the authentication server. This is generally not how it works, but again, it's like purely for demo purposes. So you understand that handshake that happens. So in my header, I can set the cookie using the cookie I created and then like everything is done. And then from then on that cookie is set and all, all things are well. So we talked about all of these things, but then I never talked about OAuth. I talked about it earlier with Fido, but I never came back to it. Um, so let's like kind of debug that piece and understand what exactly OAuth and OpenID Connect is. And I really hope I explain this well because I feel like I confuse myself every time. It's one of those things where you read, the more you know, the less you know. Um, and so <laughs> OpenID Connect and OAuth, we, I'm gonna talk about it not from a conceptual level, but we'll talk about the implementation because hopefully the implementation will be easier to explain than the conceptual. Uh, and so we'll talk about web sign-in because that's generally what we do. We always, have, we always have to create an application where someone has to sign in and log in and log out and sign out, so on. And so with web sign-on, we can have like a user and we have a client. And so anytime you wanna pass it back, you have to pass a username and a password, let's say, to your client. To your, let's say the browser is the resource server. And then that generally gives you a redirect to your auth server, which is what you see on the top. And then the, the resource, the auth server will then give you a cookie or it'll set the cookie onto the user, which then like allows you to make requests and so on. And so this is like kind of a general workflow of how it works. I showed you earlier again, like it's kind of a reiteration. Hopefully reiteration helps you understand at least it does for me. Um, and so from taking that high level into like, again, implementation, generally a workflow for sign in is pretty straightforward, I would say, because the idea is that you start with sign up, right? Users have to sign up for a service. They're not automatically signed up. So whenever they sign up, they would pass in a user, like an email and a password or username and a password, whatever you so choose. So you take them through, let's assume this service is like an auth service and then there's a method on it called sign up. So with that, uh, whenever I call that specific method, it will then do something. So in this particular case, it sends a user a confirmation email. And then with that confirmation e email has a token. And so I can use that token to then confirm the user, which you then see in the auth.confirm. So when a user tries to log in for the first time, they can't, they have to like go through that confirmation workflow in order to go through that process. And so once they do that, then you're allowed to log in. And so generally speaking, Whenever we implement authentication workflows and login logout workflows, this is what we deal with. So like a lot of the stuff I talked with with JWT is kind of the very deep in the weeds implementation details. And so if we were to implement that, this is just general JavaScript. Um, I'm gonna be using a library called GoTrueJS. So GoTrueJS is just a general, like similar to OAuth and Okta, it's a library that allows you to do authentication. Because as I said, do not roll your own authentication. It's not a good idea. And so I'm gonna use this library. And in order to do that, I have to pass in a specific thing. So here I'm passing in an API URL. So this is um, using Netlify itself. So the API URL has an endpoint, which is pointing to Netlify because Netlify has an identity service. And then I can also, again, I'm passing in a set cookie true. So I want, every time a user is logged in to set the cookie to true. And then in the login itself, again, like I'm just doing an auth.login. So again, like logging a user in, it's just calling a specific function. And then this is kind of where the kicker is, which is like saving a state. So this is like very controversial and like you can fight me if you'd like, but <laughs> I have chosen to save things to local storage. Again, purely for demonstration purposes. There's obviously different ways to do this. I chose to do it through local storage because it's much easier. And so with this, I can just set that user to local storage, which makes it really nice because every time a user refreshes, you then save that specific state because it's in local storage. And then whenever a user logs out, you then clear that um, from local storage itself. 
So, ah, uh, go back. Yes. Okay, so um, I have been watching Futurama a lot. So a lot of my demos are like kind of inspired by what I f my current trend is. Um, and so I've been moving a lot, which meant that I watched a lot of Futurama. It's kind of the thing. And so the idea is that this is a portal that allows you to see all deliveries in every Futurama episode. So, so if, for those of you who are unfamiliar, Futurama is a whole TV show which is based around Fry, who is a human who has been transported to like thousands of years in the future because he went through like cryogenic, it's a very long story. But the whole point is that it is about a delivery company. So like there's a couple of them and they deliver packages across the universe to different planets. Essentially, this is a login page for if you are part of a Planet Express team, you might want to have access to all the deliveries that have been made. So here is a login page. And so when I log in, I have access to like every single delivery that was made, um, as well as the destination and some notes associated with it. This is pulled from wiki, like some Futurama wiki. And I edited some things because I'm very particular. Um, some of it was wrong, so <laughs> I was sure to change that. Um, and so it shows you the contents of the package from the delivery. So here you see contents, you see specific crew members, you see like who was the recipient of that package and so on. So the whole point of this is just to show you a basic login flow. So it's just a Planet Express delivery portal. You log in, you see everything associated with every single delivery that has happened, um, and you can also log out. So that's like a very basic login, logout workflow. I didn't show you the sign up part, but assume that, that that works as well. And so that is super handy and really cool, but whenever we deal with applications, sign up is like kind of the one part of it, but oftentimes we need to also call an API. So the whole point is that we might want a user to sign in, and then we might want that application to then have third party access to extra services, to call an API on your behalf. So that workflow is slightly different from regular sign-in, because sign-in is just generally you and a server, and the auth server is like, you are the resource or an owner, therefore I'll give you access. So it's very straightforward. But with calling an API, it's a bit more finagling to do. So here, I'm gonna show you just like different screenshots. This is associated with the demo that I'll show you in a bit. But here's a login screen, again, no sign up, but this is a sign me in process. So you click a sign up, like a sign in button, which you see in the middle. The contrast might be a bit poor, but this is um, logging in through Google. So I'm doing a, th this particular application is asking for access to my Google account, specifically to my calendar account. And so here, whenever a user clicks that button, they're taken through um, to a consent page. So the consent page will then tell, it's basically Google being like, hey, this service wants access to your account. Which account should they have access to? And then you click it and then you go, you generally have to log in if you're not already logged in. And then assuming everything works and you did the auth dance, you get like a screen that shows you all of the information. So this is like my current calendar for today. Um, and that's like a really nice way of building things. So you're essentially using an OAuth workflow. So an application is getting third party access to services, in this case, Google Calendar. So I'll show you essentially what that looks like from a visual perspective. So here we have a user who's trying to access an API and there's multiple steps to this. Essentially, I have to pass a request token to the auth server, which will then give me a code which I then use that code to send it back to that server, and then that will give me a token. So it's like many steps. It's actually really confusing. It took me forever to build that. It looks really nice, but it took me really long to build that because it's really confusing. There's so many different steps and everything is stateless, which means you have to have some form of grabbing all of the information that's being passed around. Um, but you can break those two things down, like that crazy complicated step of talking to your auth server into two pieces. There is the code creation and then there is the token creation. And the token is kind of what you really need when you access APIs. So that token has encoding with like specific scopes. So in this case, I want my application to be read only because I don't want it to write to my Google account. I just want it to read my calendar events and so on. So that token is really important and it's a way that my application can access my Google account without going past the scope that I give it access to. And so once I have that, I can then call an API using that token. So this is like kind of a string of like all those URLs that I have to hit 
it might not, it, it's kind of com confusing, but I just want to show you just in general, like the workflow that's going through. So let's assume we hit a main URL. So I called it like zoomian.netlify.com. And from there, I'm going to pass down to like a functions call. So in this case, it's called Google Auth, which is a serverless function. And what that's doing is it's constructing a specific redirect URL. And that's essentially what is doing that consent flow. And so with that redirect URL, I then am taken through that consent page that you saw earlier. And that gives me an auth code. So Google is like, okay, you are the user. The user has signed in. Here is a code. And so with that code, I can then pass it to another function because I mentioned REST is stateless. So I have to like constantly pass things back and forth. So I have that auth code. So now I'm calling a separate serverless function with that code and hoping and praying I get a token back. And I usually do. Um, and so that I append as a query string parameter. And the reason I'm doing it as a query string parameter at the end is because I did a redirect. And in a redirect, you can't pass, pass anything in a body. So that's, that's generally how it is and why I did it that way. Um, I, I'll share the code later on for those of you who want to nitpick in terms of how I did everything. Um, but here is like, high, like very quickly how I implemented that um, in code. So I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna gloss over the fact that I used a function here, but I want you to focus on how exactly those things are implemented. So here, I'm, all I'm doing in this particular function is I am creating a redirect URL. So essentially, I'm trying to make that URL to point users to, to get to that content screen. So here, it's calling a function called authorize. And then within the authorize, I'm grabbing some environment variables. So here, there's a secret and an ID and maybe the specific authorized redirect URIs that I want to pass to this specific thing. And then I'm constructing a client. So this client is then what I can use to construct a URL. So that's what that's doing. And then in my, I'm going to call a separate function. So with that client created, I can then generate an auth URL. So you might see the scopes at the bottom. So scopes is actually really important. I showed you, I might have showed you on the top, but you might have seen in line five, that I'm giving access to my calendar as read only. That's very important because it's telling my application that you can only read my calendar because I do not want this application to write to my calendar. My calendar is crazy enough. I don't need it to write things to it. And so that's what's happening in this particular code. Like all it's doing is it's doing some OAuth stuff and I'm generating at the end a URL to direct users to. So that's pretty nice. So Assuming that redirect URL works, so if there is a redirect URL, then in my callback, I can 200 OK, and I can pass it in as a body. And then the next step, once everything works, is that I have to construct with, like I have that code, um, let's say, I want to then take it and give it back to Google and get a token. And so this assumes, uh, I mentioned the, the fact that I passed in query string parameters. So here is where my query string parameters I'm grabbing. There's the params, I'm grabbing that specific code, and then I'm running a function on line 11 called get access token. And so what get access token is, and this is kind of the bulk of where a lot of that OAuth happens, that magic happens, is again, I have to recreate that client. So like, because a lot of redirects happened, I can't actually pass that previous client I created. I have to recreate it, it's really annoying. Um, but essentially, once I create that client, I have access to particular methods. Previously, I used generate URL. Now I'm using get token because I have a code. So I can pass that to my auth client. And then assuming all works out, I get a access token. And then with that access token, I'm doing a redirect because I don't want users to like ping URL and then like come back to where they came from. Assume, because in this particular case, I have a token. And so there's no way for me to like kind of make a way for users to come back with that token. And so I'm going to pass it through as a redirect. So with this function, if it's pinged and you get a token, I'm going to redirect back to the root or the refer in this case. And so that's where that 302 comes in. So once everything works and I have an auth code successfully created, I can then redirect the user back. And then this is kind of where that redirect happens. So that location is I'm setting where exactly to send a user to. So the referrer is just grabbing from where exactly the user came from. And then I can then append 
onto it that token that the user needs. So once all of this works, I still don't have like anything visually. I, st I just have a token. And so once I have this token, I can then like do a couple of things. So here I'm just checking whether or not there is a token. If, if there is a token, I'm going to run like get a specific URL parameters. This is like spe a specific function I wrote for this purpose. But the, the bulk of how it's getting my calendar is on line three. It's just grabbing calendar events. So it's available in the scope, so this.token. But what I'm going to start with is just creating that URL in which I want to make that access. So OAuth was the first part of how things work. So once you have that token, you now have to construct a URL to access calendar events. So that's like kind of a complicated part. If you try to use the Google API, it's a, it's a bit confusing. But what, that's what's happening from line 17 to 20. It's just accessing like when I want to start and end grabbing events. So this is just doing like the beginning to the end of the day. So an entire day essentially. And then with that, I can then give like this crazy long URL, which is all it's doing is just going to calendar, grabbing all the events for that specific day. So you might see like start and end over there and order by start time, also very important because then it orders all your events chronologically. So you don't have to do like crazy parsing and so on. <coughs> and then the next part also is making sure that that is an authenticated request. So we have our token, I'm gonna pass it through as an authorization bearer header. So here is where I'm passing that token to Google being like, hey, I'm a user and I have a token, give me back information. And then with that, I can then do other things like parsing all the JSON and then visualizing it on a page. So let's see if this works. <laughs> it, it, it works on this browser actually. Oh yes, I was looking at the weather. Okay, so this is like where I like cross my fingers and hope things work. Um, so this is a page. Uh, it allows me to sign in, so I'm gonna sign in. It takes me to my Google consent page, so it shows me like all the accounts that I currently signed in. I'm gonna click create me, and like, it, it worked, okay, cool. So now it shows me all of the events and calendars associated with this, the current day. So you see like, I am out of office, but I also did not say no to all these events I have to be at. <laughs> um, <laughs> if only I could clone myself. And so that's really nice, the ability for you to like sign in and also like call an API. Those two things are generally what we do in our applications. And that's like generally why we need to learn and understand how OAuth work works. And so to conclude and just to like kind of reiterate this point, I know I showed you how to roll your own authentication, but please do not do it. Uh, and this is a PSA, a friendly PSA, to not roll your own authentication ever. Oh my gosh, my animations ran very quickly. Um, but I have resources um, as to all the code that I ran over, um, as well as certain, so like the bottom, bottom most URL is, um, if for those of you who are familiar with Auth0, they are a service that does a lot of authentication for you, they're a provider. And they just recently, maybe two months ago, released a series of videos called um, Learn Identity. And it goes into like painstaking detail as to like what is OpenID Connect, what is, what is Auth0 and OAuth and how all of those things connect. It's pretty specific to, to Auth0, but at the same time it shows like specific concepts that you might not know. Um, and it also goes over web sign-in as well as uh, if you wanna do mobile app stuff, cause that's a very different workflow. Um, if you've ever heard the word Pixie, that is a, it's not spelled P-I-X-I-E -I -I as I learned very recently. It is spelled P-K-C-E, it's called proof of key exchange. Key code exchange? Yes, but if you're interested in learning more, like this kind of was a high level idea, you can go to that URL. It's incredibly handy. I think it's like almost 10 hours of video or something like that, but it's very comprehensive. And it's also one of the resources that I believe Auth0 uses to onboard new, new employees. And so with that, thank you so much for your attention. Again, um, we're hiring and I'd love to work with all of you lovely people. So come find me. I also have stickers. If you do not want a job and you'd rather have stickers, um, no judgment. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you for your attention.